from uh, Friday. We were looking at the results of these uh, tensile tests that are taken on the sample solids, uh, usually supplied by the manufacturer, threaded on each end, uh, about uh, a quarter of an inch in diameter is a fairly standard uh, sample size, but uh, that's more tradition than anything. And there's also lots of examples of a sample that looks more like this being tested um, rather than uh, uh, this kind of thing. It, just, it does take a different machine or at least different jaws in the machine. Uh, typically about two inches on either side of uh, two little marks that are put in and then that is the starting length what we call the L0 of the piece and then it's uh, put in the jaws and, and can either be pulled in tension or pushed in compression uh, very often both not both with the same piece uh, a load or some representation of the load on the y-axis typically in terms of the normal strain which is the uh, applied load over the original area and if you remember the original areas of concern especially later in the test because there is necking that goes on and then the response to that load in terms of the strain was on the x-axis. And remember that can typically be very, very small, especially in the early stages of the, uh, of the test. And we were uh, looking at uh, typical structural steels, like low carbon steels, a general structural representative of what we call a ductile material. There's two typical responses of ductile, steel, uh, ductile materials. The steels tend to do something like this. As the load increases, a little bit of strain is resident and it occurs in a very linear fashion for quite some time. Anywhere along here, if the load is removed, the response of the material is to return to its original size, which means returns to zero strain. Any material who, uh, once the load is removed, has zero residual strain in it, is considered an elastic material. And this is the elastic region. And you can imagine uh, just how steep this is is pretty important to the different materials. And then uh, we do tend to leave that linear region, go through a couple different parts to it as we went over. Uh, those are not of particularly great concern to us because we will do most of our look at things in the elastic region. As you can imagine, uh, that's highly desirable for structural materials, that they can be loaded and unloaded and they always return to a state of zero strain. Uh, generally quite, uh, quite uh, desirable. So this might be a, a uh, uh, indication of the end of that proportional limit, um, but it's very, very close to that. We also have what we call the yield stress. And that's the stress that's in the back of your book. If you open up the back of your book, you don't have to do it now. We'll, we'll use this as we go along. It might be helpful uh, to at least photocopy the back pages of the book where there's uh, lots and lots of different types of materials. And one of the most important quantities in those tables is this yield stress. The, uh, the highest you can go for the, uh, for the stress 
and still remain within that elastic limit for different materials. The uh, peak there is typically the ultimate stress, and I believe that's also in the table. There's two tables on the, in the back. One is in English units, one in SI units. Uh, and I believe the uh, ultimate limit is in most of those materials, or most of those tables. And then we have then a, uh, also a stress at rupture. Uh, this is well into the region where that necking occurs where the narrowing down of the material in the test section itself causes a drastic reduction in the area that's uh, withstanding that stress. And the real curve actually goes something like this if you use the actual cross-sectional area as opposed to using the original or nominal uh, cross-sectional area there. So we looked at that uh, in some detail yesterday, There's or Friday. There's just a refresher for it. Uh, however, this is a bit of a false picture that I've drawn because the real uh, stress strain diagram drawn more to scale. If you remember, we had some very, very small numbers down here, and I did not draw the x-axis to scale, not to a, either a logarithmic scale, which we couldn't do because we have zero in that scale, uh, nor to a, a, a proper linear scale. And that's because there's very, very little strain in this elastic region for these low carbon steels. They don't elongate very much. So the true diagram actually is more something like this, where it's very, very difficult even to see the slope in that early region because there's so little strain through that elastic region. So a couple of the problems that I want you to do are actually uh, nothing more than an attempt to, to accurately portray this in some usable way. One way to do that, this is what the, uns, the, uh, the true diagram looks like. You can see it's very, very steep in here. It's almost imperceptible that there's any slope at all. And then it does something like what I've drawn. So uh, there's a couple different ways you can handle this fact that there's the most important region essentially disappears in a scale drawing. One thing you can do is you can break out the scale, the linear region. Notice that this left-hand diagram only goes up to 0.03, which is way, way back in here, almost completely disappearing. Break that out, draw it to one scale, get a good look at the linear um, region, and as you can guess, this slope is going to be very important to us and then have the rest of the diagram drawn to a much larger scale. So that's one way you can handle this fact. Have two graphs that represent the two of them uh, on different scales side by side. Another way to do it is to use color and you can either have uh, the one of the color diagrams at the top or you can have them both at the bottom. Could have had the red one here for the red line, and then the blue one right above it for the blue line. Uh, this is much like how your book approaches it. For those of you that have had me for Physics 1 before, you know that I don't like this way to do it. Why not? It's a little confusing. Uh, you don't immediately know. Uh, it's, it's relatively clear. Uh, that the blue line goes with the blue scale, the red line goes with the red scale. The trouble is, if you photocopy this, you get none of that because all the lines are then black in a photocopy. There might be a very slight difference in just how black the lines are, but if that is photocopied, if you wanted to photocopy that and have it in your notebook, uh, that method of displaying the differences is useful. 
Another way that's typical, and this is commonly found in the scientific literature, is to put a little arrow that indicates to which scale the two axes respond, uh, uh, pertain. And so instead of any color being used, just an arrow says read the down, the, the bottom scale. This one says read the above scale. Uh, if you do it this way, make sure that you don't have the top line referring to the bottom scale and the bottom line referring to the top scale. It's just a chance of confusion for the reader. And any time you're making graphs like this, you're trying to make them as clear as possible, I assume. So there's at least one problem in the homework where we give you some of this test data, allow you to graph it. That's all I did in these plots myself. I just took the data out of those, those uh, problems and practice, decide some way, not only figure out how to get the graphing software to do what you want, but also decide how you like it as a way to represent the data more accurately. Uh, as part of the homework. And then you can also, I think you're also supposed to pick off some of the yield limits and uh, the, the significant stresses in other places as well. Oh, the, uh, I think I used an R for rupture stress rather than a B for breaking stress. Different authors use different things. So those are the three possibilities. Uh, feel free to even come up with your own possibility as to how you might want to represent these these uh, different uh, different ways to represent the very same thing in a way that's useful for the useful for the reader. Remember that's your concern ultimately. All right, so let's take a look then at this elastic region and what it can mean to us as designers. Focusing just on the elastic region, we can get uh, a little bit more information um, than we might uh, otherwise see. So in greatly expanded scale, something like that. Since this does go through the origin, then any spot on that will actually give you the slope of that uh, linear region. So the, the slope is, let's see, uh, it's just going to be the stress over the strain at that, that point. And the steeper that line is, the greater the stress the material can absorb for a given strain response. So that's pretty important, as you can imagine. This is then a material property. It comes right from the tests. The test comes right from the manufacturer. And so it's a publicized value, generally uh, publicized by the manufacturer of the material the structural members themselves, often uh, uh, a, a certain uh, customer might want to do their own test as well. In that case, they'll order some of these samples, pieces from the uh, manufacturer and redo the test themselves just to make sure. This is known as the elastic modulus or modulus of elasticity which is the uh, meaning of the capital E. You may remember this from Physics 1 as Young's Modulus. Given a capital Y. Uh, it's not, uh, it, it's fairly typical that uh, there'll be different symbols for things in physics than there are for the very same quantity in engineering. Then to streamline things a little bit, of course, we can look at this ratio and we realize that uh, we can cancel a couple like terms top and bottom, so it's really S over AIM 
as the ratio, uh, which is a little bit quicker, a little bit, a little, a little bit. You don't think that's going to be on the test? S over A? When I taught this course seven years ago or something, and I could do that joke, I've been waiting 20 years <laughs> to do that joke from when I took it and my uh, professor did it for me. I thought, that's a good joke. I'm keeping that one. But I never taught it until 20 years later. So, uh, at, like I said, this is a, a very much a property of the material. And we will take it as a constant, which for the most part it, it is. There's very little that could change that. Maybe some uh, extreme temperature limits might cause some differences in that. Um, but they have to be pretty extreme. It actually might be such that the material itself is really changing in uh, structure at higher temperatures that would change that. So we take that pretty much as a property just like we would density. Um, and that's why it's in the book, in the back of the book, uh, listed as a, a material quantity. Um, real quick, uh, just to show you uh, aluminum alloys have a, are also ductile materials, but they have a slightly different characteristic curve in that they tend to have a linear region that doesn't end in such as, as uh, nicely a defined way. They do have this necking response to rupture. Uh, a bit of a different looking curve. It's a little harder to define where the linear region ends. So one thing that's uh, commonly done is a a uh, particular strain is arbitrarily chosen, something like, make sure to get the number right, 0.2%. And then parallel to the curve up from that, then they can pick that off, and that's often given then as the uh, yield stress. One thing that's interesting about these type of curves, and partly why that is chosen, is that the test generally goes up the curve. If it gets to this point and the load is relieved, it tends to come down this line. Once you've gone past the uh, true linear region up into the curve somewhere, if you relieve it, the load at that time, you'll come down this line to a point where the load is completely removed but some residual strain remains. That there is a permanent lengthening. Remember, that's what the strain is. It's, a, it's the physical response to the material to this strain, uh, to the stressing. Uh, there's some permanent stretch, if you will, that's left in the material now, even though the load's been completely removed. If the test is then resumed from that place, they go up this. 2% offset curve, and then for the most part, back on to the, the, the regular curve. Uh, sometimes with a little bit of change, maybe a, a little bit of a lowering of this. Um, not of great concern to us, again, because we're going to spend almost all, if not all, of the rest of the term in this elastic region. Uh, as we look at materials that behave in very predictable ways for us so that we can uh, spend some good attention to them. An interesting curve in a very common structural solid is uh, the, the test curve of concrete and uh, it does highlight the, the difference in concrete in terms of tension tests and compression tests. If this test is run on concrete in uh, tension, it does something like this and then uh, ruptures there. It doesn't There's very little, if any, necking of concrete. So it doesn't have this 
this curl over part that came uh, more as an arithmetic fact of the of using the original area even though the cross-sectional area is now changing. Remember that's what caused the uh, the uh, curve to curl over of it there. So we'll have uh, some yield stress for the concrete in tension, but concrete is actually a much better compressive material and so the compression test, which would look like that because uh, we take compressive forces to be negative, but it's also a shortening of the material itself, so it would have a negative strain as well. These slopes are constant either side of the unloaded condition, but the concrete goes much farther in compression than it does in tension. <coughs> would you still label both the sigma y or do you pardon me? Would you still would you label them both the sigma y? Uh, there there may be some other little symbol on them that You'd never, it's very rare you'd have a piece that needs to go into tension and compression in its lifetime. Um, there are certain materials, there's certain, uh, uh, you can imagine certain engineering designs where a material has to cycle in and out of compression and tension. Um, concrete is not real good for that, partly because it is so weak in tension. Uh, this. This can be a factor of up to almost somewhere, somewhere around eight, and it's true for wood as well. The difference between these two is uh, almost a factor of eight in some concrete mixes. We're going to look at ways to handle. Well, you've you've heard about ways to handle this uh, by putting into the concrete reinforcing bars, or what's known as rebar. Give me a second to reset the tape. So we'll, we'll actually look at some design uh, ways we can design concrete that it can do better in tension. Because even though it's not good in tension, as you'll see in a couple, uh, couple weeks, it's vitally important and unavoidable that concrete has to take some tension because of uh, uh, the way we're going to look at things. Actually, it's no big secret. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at loaded beams that uh, have transverse loads, and their response to that, of course, is to deform something like that, exaggerated, of course, uh, with some kind of load on it. We'll actually look at that bending in a couple weeks. As it bends like this, the top of the beam is going into compression. The bottom of the beam is going into tension. If you've got a concrete beam like this, it's unavoidable that the bottom of the beam is now in tension. So uh, we're going to look at how to help that by putting in reinforcing bars, rebar, across the bottom of the beam, and the rebar then will absorb the tension uh, and the concrete will not. If you go look at some of the older concrete bridges around here, and New York is famous for having old bridges now, you'll see a lot of the beam, the concrete uh, structure of the of the uh, bridge is actually quite broken away at the bottom, maybe even exposing the rebar. In fact, there's a couple places out in front of the building that's done that, this, the, where you can see the exposed rebar, because the concrete intention is actually broken away, uh, and just the rebar remains. But uh, when we design it, uh, as we look at this uh, technique we completely take the tense, the concrete intention out of the calculation anyway and assume that it's all on the rebar. Anyway, that's, that's for the future, a little bit of a taste of what's to come. Um, the, last, uh, the last material of any importance 
that we need to look at before we really start to look at this stress over strain business. Brittle materials like glass or brick or ceramics typically have curves like this. Very little identifiable linear region, no necking at all, um, and uh, a fairly low yield stress, yield stress in uh, uh, intention especially. So uh, brick is very good as a compressive structural material like concrete is, uh, but since brick typically comes in individual small pieces, it's not uh, really uh, commercially viable to put any kind of rebar in it. Okay, so let's look at this elastic modulus, modulus of elasticity, and uh, take another peek at it, see, uh, see some of the things we can learn from it. Let's see, that's uh, P over A. I'm not going to put the A0 on there, we just, you have to understand that's the original uh, area, same thing for the length, save a little bit of trouble. So if we put those things together, we get something like that. If we, uh, if we move things around a little bit and do a little bit of uh, uh, just quick algebra, we'll see something that is very familiar, you'll see is very familiar to what you've seen before. And that's uh, that, yeah, that's what I want. Let's, we'll bring the P over all by itself and we'll put everything else on the other side. So that's going to be E, A, del, over L. Is that right? Yeah, that looks good. Uh, one thing we'll do on a lot of problems is, uh, is we'll actually put this E and this A together as a single number for a particular problem because those are essentially constants. In fact, all three of those numbers are really nothing more than constants as far as a problem is concerned. These three are independent of any load, tension, compression, or no load at all. These three, uh, this is a material constant. These are uh, properties of the structure of the uh, piece itself. So this is really a some constant times a uh, elongation. This should look quite familiar. It looks very much like Hooke's Law for springs. And indeed, that's exactly what it is. These materials uh, behave elastically um, very much like a spring does just happens to be that for our common experience, these deformations are very, very small. And they also function out of um, tension. Springs are more off of torsion because of the wire twists as the spring expands. Oh, well, yeah. When you put the spring in tension, the material is actually twisting yeah. more than uh, uh, simply elongating. Yeah, you're right. But the, the overall response of the spring and the, the pieces we're looking at uh, in these cases are very, very much the same. Okay. We'll look at a simple problem just to start getting used to the numbers. So imagine we have a structural member in a nuclear facility of zirconium alloy. Uh, regular steels in a nuclear um, nuclear atmosphere, if you will, uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, bombardment due to different radioactive decay particles, uh, structural steel changes drastically. 
under that kind of low margin, which means that these uh, the modulus of elasticity changes drastically. So typically, you have to use a little bit more exotic structural members in a nuclear power plant um, that uh, are much, much uh, sturdier against the nuclear bombardment. There's a thing called hydrogen embrittlement, where uh, the materials are constantly bombarded and they become much more brittle uh, under that. Zirconium does not tend to do that. So let's imagine this is three foot in length, and I want you to find the radius given a couple things. The yield stress is 57.5 KSI, remember that's thousands of pounds per square inch. So this is 57,000 pounds per square inch. The modulus of elasticity is 14 times 10 to the third KSI. Now, remember the modulus of elasticity is units of pressure, like KSI, over units of inches per inch or meters per meter. So the ultimate units on the modulus of elasticity are uh, either pascals or PSI, or their uh, brothers and sisters, KSI and K kilopascals and the like. And then one other thing I'd like you to do is apply a factor of safety of three. And then find the radius of that piece given those, uh, those uh, bits of information. Uh, one more. We're going to need to load it. So put it under a four kip compression load. Now that factor of safety, there's different ways you can apply it. It's, the end result's going to be the same. One of the ways to apply it is you can reduce the ultimate, or the, the yield stress by three, uh, and then work with a much smaller allowable yield stress. Or you can uh, reduce that, or you can calculate the final radius and then uh, multiplied by three. That's a little bit different because that changes the area by nine, not by three. Okay, I think you've got all the pieces there you need. Yep. All right, so, given the modulus elasticity, given the load, um, Yeah, we've got all the parts we need. We can then, then find the, uh, the area, and then from the area, you find the radius. Remember, the stress is P over A, but you've got to get a, a factor of safety in there. And one way to do that is to make a ratio that we now have an allowable stress that's one third of the yield stress because the factor of safety is three. So that's a fairly typical way to do it. Reduce the, the properties of the material by the factor of safety, and then design for that stress, which is a much smaller stress. Oh, so you do that first. Yeah, that, that's a more typical way to do it. There might be different standards in different industries, uh, 
order different companies, but you have to understand what it is. That's Sigma allow. Yeah. So you design for this much lower stress than the yield stress of the material proper. Just to start getting used to these numbers. So design for a yield stress of something like 19.2. And that factor of safety is semi-arbitrary. It's uh, through experience that they decided three is about right. Two probably would have been safe enough, but they went even to three for a factor of safety on the factor of safety, I guess, if you will. But that, was, that allows a lot of margin for miscalculations, assumptions, or uh, uh, maybe even experimental differences in what the yield stress really is. So. Typically, we don't design very, very important pieces like structural members and nuclear power plants right to the limit. Put a big factor of safety on. Then you've got the load. You can solve for the area. Then once you have the area, you can solve for the radius, which I hope you remember is pi r squared. for the area. That's just the load of four kips and the allowable stress of 19.2. And then you should get a radius of Phil? Is probably then, uh, well, since uh, uh, this isn't a standard piece, you can make it to any radius you'd want since it's probably a one off piece for whatever reactor. But if you're looking at some um, bolt or something, you'd want to make sure that you have a standard radius so you don't have to custom make every one of these parts to that exact radius. You might want to just make it 0.3 and, and buy stuff off the shelf that way. All right, one other quick uh, look at the kind of thing. What, what would be the uh, load find the allowable load for a deformation of 0.02 inches. And since we're talking about compression, that would actually be a decrease, it'd be a, a minus there, but the minus is uh, our typical designation for a compressive load anyway. So given that, the original length, you can find the strain We've got the area from the first one. We know the elastic modulus. Then you can solve for an allowable load to keep a strain, a, a deformation of no greater than that. So less than or equal to that strain. And you can solve for these. And if there's some deformation limit on there, You should be able to ascertain that this is 
something like minus, again, the minus being compression, minus 1.62 kips. This was just an original given load that went to now on this minimum allowable deformation of whatever occurs with the design beyond that uh, is, is a greater part of the problem than what we're looking at. safety on that so if it's 1.62 1.63 it makes no difference because you're way way under what the uh, limits were by applying this factor safety so that's a very typical way the factor safety is applied it's uh, right on the material properties themselves okay any questions before we look at another problem Question? How do you find a radius? That from the area solved for the radius. How do you find the area? That was from the uh, uh, allowable stress, which is the yield stress reduced by the factor of safety, which is then our uh, given load, the four kips, divided by the area, which is unknown. So you had to find the area. Then from the area, find the radius. Now, did did it not work for you? Did you remember the square? Did, did anybody else get that these numbers? So those are okay. As you're making me nervous now. Yeah, I think you guys, it's just now a, a knee-jerk reaction to it. just automatically say my numbers are wrong. And for once, they weren't. Caught you off guard. All right, another problem. We have a, a simply, pin, simply pin beam supported by a cable there and holding a load of some kind. Maybe my, uh, my mother-in-law again, we haven't seen her for a couple weeks. Uh, two feet and three feet along a, a five meter beam. And this is also three feet and that's four feet. So the, that's the basic setup. The, uh, 
the deal is when this weight is applied, the beam, now we're gonna treat this beam as a rigid beam, which remember means it does not undergo any bending itself. We're only looking at what happens to these cables once this load is applied. And greatly exaggerated the, the um, beam turns down to there. The load drops a little bit. And given that this point B drops by let's say 0.025 inches. Find the, well, just let's just make it the mass. What do I have here? No, we'll find the load, W. Remember, W equals mg is all. Now, the, thanks, Tom. The reason it's doing that is because this cable is stretching due to the load. So I have a couple other pieces to give you. software's quick today. All right, let me give you something about those cables themselves. There's two cables here. We'll, uh, let's label the parts for reference. A, B, C, D, E. We'll call this down here C, this N, D, that N, E. Both cables are of what's called A36 steel. with a cross-sectional area cables B, E, and B, C. With a nominal cross-sectional area of 0 0.002 square inches. Given that, then we can find uh, find um, how much load will do that. A greater load will cause DE to stretch even more, and a lesser load will cause it to stretch less. So given this displacement of that point B, point B itself drops 0.025 inches, then find the... Uh, how much load causes that kind of deformation in the cable DE. Anybody happen to have their book here? Because you're going to need the modulus of elasticity of the uh, A36 steel. So it's the very, very back, uh, even be all past all pages. So I believe it's, I believe it's the very back cover, back inside cover. Okay, so take a chance to look at everybody's book. Well, should be there, A36 steel. And I, the, the top table is English units, the bottom one is SI units. Yeah. So if you don't want to bring your book you might want to uh, video copy, uh, sorry, photocopy those two, uh, those two pages and just keep them in your notebook. Tom, what does it have there for the modulus of elasticity for A36 steel? Uh, 29. 29 what? 10 to the third. Times 10 to the third? KSI? Okay, so 10 to the 6th P 
PSI. So watch your units in all of these. Remember, we're working with some very, very large numbers and some very, very small numbers. geometry, you can find how much the cable here elongates that will actually be its deformation. Then, uh, then you can find out what, what load what must be in there to cause that. Make sure I gave you all the pieces. What you need is the force in the cable ED that will cause that kind of elongation. Once you have that force, you can then find W by a moment balance on the uh, piece itself. So use the geometry to find how much the cable ED stretches. Use that and the material properties to find out the force that's doing that, then that force should give you the weight by a moment balance on the structural member itself. The member, uh, what is it? A A B D. Yeah. You know, just pull that into the door and then scooch back in. What else said a booby trap? Remember, these drawings, of course, are greatly exaggerated, as are my qualifications in my resume. Make some sense, David? Getting it? I just need to know what problem. the strain with the modulus of elasticity and then find the load in that piece and once you find that you can 
then determine what W is based on a, just a, a simple proportion yeah, through the moments. What's not working? Zero two photos. Wow. That helps. Yeah, put me in charge. Yeah, remember, remember these are greatly exaggerated and not to scale. Nicely drawn, but not to scale. So, okay. David? What's the mass? What is it? How much is it? You're supposed to find that. Okay, that's <laughs> because a certain mass will cause the deflection here I gave you, will cause the deflection here you find, putting a certain strain into the cable. Once you find the strain, you can then find the force that caused it and then go back from there to find the, the weight. We can check some numbers as we go along. Strain is that 0417 over the original length. Remember, the units must cancel on strain, it's, it's unitless. Should get something like 0.116. Okay, and then that then can lead you to the stress in DE because we now have the strain in DE and we know the modulus of elasticity. units on these problems. Um, no, I can't strength? guarantee the book does or doesn't. What? What was your strain? No, that, I, that is the strain. You already have that. Oh, Alright, not the stress. The stress? I don't know if I have it separately. Yeah, I didn't calculate the, the stress separately because the load um, force in DE is E solves, solves when you solve for the load is force over area and then the strain and the ratio of the stress and the strain of the Modular plasticity. So I don't, I don't separately have the stress, but I do have this number. I don't know. There's no units. Doesn't look right. Oh wait, yeah. Let's look at a different one. It's, don't guess. The units work.
Phil, do you have this force that's in the cable? Do you have that separately? Uh, like 67.18 pounds of force. Yeah. Or Tom, what you're looking for, the way you had it was 0.067 kip. Then you can use that to find out what weight if you sum the moments about point A. sponsor pads of this paper for us, but they'll put their corporate logo at the top. Then we get it for free. We can handle a little bit of advertising. We always can in this day and age. Joe, okay. Yeah, you've got that. Now, with the original length, didn't write down <laughs> three feet. Yeah. Now you can find the strain in that piece. Once you find the strain, you can use the modulus of elasticity of that material, which is given, material property. The load that will cause that strain is in here in the stress. And so that's what I've done here. I've solved for it. It's just uh, E, Epsilon, A, all three of those are now known. So you can find the load in there, and then from that find the uh, extra load. That, yeah, that looks like, it. that's right. With that, though, you can also find the strain in this piece and then determine where, uh, actually where the load ends up because remember the load is going to drop due to the angle on the, the beam and the fact that its own cable is going to stretch a little bit. So there's a compounding effect of how far C will actually drop. will drop uh, this delta YB plus its own uh, elongation. It's a matter of grams for the load. Phil, what'd you get for the load? For the mass, I had 3.48 pounds of mass. Or zero. No. I didn't ask for the mass, <coughs> asked for the weight. It's 111.97 um, pounds of force. 112 pounds. And then <coughs> notice that uh, the, the weight C itself will drop by its own elongation <coughs> in that cable plus the amount its attachment point dropped. So there's uh, there's two two sets of numbers there that have this low dropping. And remember, it could be that the material none of the, there's no material failure, but it could be that that weight dropped so far that it, it whatever its design purpose was is no longer viable. Okay, Joe, you all right? No, what's the matter? Oh. Are, are you, you just need more time or are you stuck somewhere? Kind of stuck. 
where, where did you, you got some of these numbers? Did you get down to this stress? Yeah. And then? I solved for that e equals 29 times 10 to the third. And I solved for the stress. Right. So you can solve for the stress, which itself is the force in EB over the area of the cable, which I gave you. This strain is known. And so you can uh, solve for that force then, and that should be the 67 pounds once you solve for this force, because these things are all now known. And then once you solve for that force, you can do a moment balance about point A and find the, what weight is balancing that force. that help a little bit? Okay. Look at it uh, outside the class. If you're still having trouble, come see me. We'll fix it up. All right, let's set up another problem. Imagine we have a structural member that we can approximate with this picture. And it's loaded such that there's uh, 30 kip at that free end, 45 at this interface between the two different pieces in that direction. And at midpoint, There's a load like that of 75 kip. So I've drawn those each at their point of application by whatever means. Details. 12 inches. Another 12 inches. And then 16 inches across there. And an area here. nine square inches and a third of that a third of that there and again a 36 steel so it has the same modulus of elasticity you to find the deformate the total deformation of that entire piece here on the bigger piece, 0.3 inches squared there on the smaller piece. find that. What you need to realize is that each of the three sections, 
will deform by a certain amount because each of the three sections is under a different load, has different cross-sectional area, so we need to find how the individual pieces deform and then we can find the overall deformation by simply adding all those up. find the load in that piece. So, easy as anything to do is to make an imaginary cut in that section. To figure out what the load is in that section. Kip there, 45 there, and 75 there. These are all kips. I put an imaginary cut in the section AB so I can figure out what the load is there. And once I figure out what the load is, I can then use the modulus elasticity, the cross-sectional area, and the original length to figure out the deformation in that section. We've got, uh, what, 100, 105 to the right, 45 to the left, so we need 60 kip in there to balance that. So now we know that in section AB, it's deformation. Which comes from however much load is in that piece, which we just found out is the 60. Its original length, which is the 12 inches, its original area, the 0.9, and the given ohm modulus of elasticity. And then after that, it's a matter of making sure the units all balance. Checking the units. Kip, kip, inches squared, inches squared. We're left with just inches, which is what we'd expect a deformation in inches. So we'll carry an extra sig figure two through to the end. So we know section AB is in tension. That's then a growth over just that region AB. Then you need to do it again between B and C. And then you need to do it again for C to D. And you can do the same thing. So you'll get a change in length of each one of the sections 
and then the three of them added up will be the total deformation of the entire piece. All right, we're at the end. So you should be able to calculate one of those. And then uh, we'll talk about that, wrap it up on Friday.